Hi, I'm Jerome Schroer, so co-founder of Ozmo. And I'm a software engineer by training. So I work for companies like Ubisoft, LucasArts, and then Google. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about Ozmo. So first, what is Ozmo? So I just want to go and show you the main video. Last Thursday, we are in Apple Store Retails, so it's pretty, pretty excited about this. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you the story of the creative process behind Hosmo and explain some of the main design decisions we made along the way. I, would, I hope it will inspire some of you. So my, my Osmo adventure started a little less than two years ago when Pramod, the co-founder, showed me a tech demo he was working on. It was in a small room. He had the laser cut acrylic board, like this one, and put an iPad on his side. Then he opened very carefully a small tin box filled with cotton, and he pulled a small mirror that would clip on top of the iPad, like this thing over there. Then he also pulled a storage bag with cards, and the cards have graphics on them, and some cryptic marks also are on, on the sides. Then he fired, he fired up the iPad, and the iPad would know exactly where every card would be, would know the position and the orientation in real world and which card it was. And even at this stage, this very simple detection, he got uh, positive signs of engagement from kids. So then he asked me, how do I go about creating games from there? So fast forward a month later, we officially, officially created Tangible Playing, and we had enough angel funding to sustain our families to go through that project. It was clear at this point that introducing a new interactive interaction model around the fun experience was the way to go. People are usually a lot more open to try something new if it's fun. We also had a strong intuition that, an, uh, strong intuition that interaction model involving more senses would have a high educational value. And we both had young kids, so it was pretty natural for us to target kids at this time. So what do we have, what do we have at this point? We have an iPad with a small contraption that makes it look at the table in front of it. There is nothing like that out there. There is no, we could find some similar interaction model in some museums, but nothing that was cheap enough and simple enough to be mass market. This is basically a new interaction model. The 
psychological barrier is very high when you ask someone to change the way that you think. We had to be super, super simple and, and very importantly feel very natural. We had to focus harder on the user experience that's most, most products out there. At, at this point, we made a few critical decisions. The elements that the kids were manipulating should not have any obvious markers. We should not attract the eyes to details that are not relevant to a human user. The experience should not happen on the board. It should not be limiting the space. It would feel much like, like a screen. But in the physical world, which is almost infinite, we, we have to take advantage of that. At the origin, the, the device is all passive. There is no electronic, no battery to worry about. And we wanted to keep this way. Um, and we try also very hard to use the touchscreen as little as possible to keep the interaction on the table and as seamless as possible. Especially when we talk about the call loop, we didn't want the kids to touch the screen at all. All these decisions made creating the software a lot more complex. All the input that we get throughout the whole experience, everything goes through that camera here the front-facing camera of the iPad. Luckily, Pramod, my co-founder, spent most of his time at Google actually building the Google Book Scanning Machine. That scanning machine could actually scan and understand a thousand pages an hour. So he knew a little bit more than a few things about computer vision. And if you ask him, it was more us by far more challenging. <laughs> so, for the first 10 months, we were only two in the company on that project. And our, old, our roles were pretty clear. Pramod was handling the business side and the computer vision. And I was doing the game experiences and also designing the hardware. So I approached the hardware design as if I was designing software, because I'm a software engineer, straight to the point and foolproof, assuming that nobody would read the documentation. <laughs> which happens, <laughs> which is true, because mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have the either. Um, it translates to a couple of constraints. It should be safe and easy for a kid about three years old to be able to set it up. And my kids were 18 months old at the time, and they were the ultimate test. <laughs> Inspired by the iPad design, we wanted something very simple and very small. And as you can see here, it has a part on the top of the iPad and a part that will actually hold the iPad itself. But when you have two parts, it's bound, one is bound to be missing. So what I did is I just added magnets, so it's actually playful to put the two parts together. Um, and when you do that, actually kids find it fun and actually put the things together. Those are the small little things that makes the experience a lot nicer and memorable. So two months in the project, we had a few working games prototypes. The, the detection started to be good enough so we could put in for a few more kids. And we had a couple of different demos. And one of them was a small music app where on the screen you would say you would see uh, a stage and you would and you would have like instrument tiles on the, on the table. As soon as you put an instrument, the iPad would play a sound of that instrument. And if you were to hide that instrument and, and show it again, the iPad would sh uh, play that sound again. So it was almost like if you were to could tap the, the card and the card would actually magically, just, it's just cardboard tiles, so there is no electronic. So it would be just like if you would tap the card, remove your fingers and it would Play, like, play a song just like a, a button, except that it was not really, it's not really a button. You could totally tap the card, leave your hand, and then nothing would happen. And that created some frustration. This small kind of misunderstanding about the interaction model was leading to frustration and people who didn't quite like it. So at this point, we internalized something critical. 
we can't ask people to adjust to an interaction model that is close but different to the ones they already know. We have to give them some an interaction that is immediate to grasp. We should not try to be better at tap than the touch screen, or faster at typing than the keyboard, or more precise at pointing than the mouse. We need to find what Osmo is really good at and play its strength. So we took a deep look at basic possible interaction with cards. And the simplest one is just putting a card. You could also hide them, just like I was uh, mentioning previously. Or you could stack them or creating systems with cards, arrangements. And we felt that arrangements actually has a lot to offer because you could use your 10 fingers. It's a very good use of the 10 fingers, which is kind of unique. Um, it creates also a system on the table, which makes the physical element uh, all more um, useful. So we did a couple of demo based on that demos based on that interaction. And for example, we had a, one demo where you had a character on the screen, and you you could dress him up. So you would put, a, for example, a short tile, and then a, a red tile next to it, and then you would wear a red shirt. Also, we're showing some patterns in the mix. So here, for example, he would wear a red shirt with blue stripes. It teaches logic as well. We were fair like, yeah, awesome. That's, that's a super start. But actually, it wasn't working so good. As we were giving cards to the kids, you, were, you would put the shirt, then a color, and then another color. And then when we see that, we. What should we display on the screen? What kind of feedback? We could either try spend a lot of time trying to explain kids how they sh how it should work and give them rules, but that really just kind of like um, uh, defeat the purpose of the real world where you can explore and basically do whatever you like. And we also had one kid that took the cards and created a long row of all the cards, and at this point you. He didn't look at the screen anymore, it was all in the physical way. And he actually had fun doing it, playing with the cards. So this is when we started to have a deep look into play patterns. What kids are actually doing with that play. Aligning cards is fun, so is stacking cubes, or moving a toy car around. All our existing play patterns we should tap on. At this point, we were four months into the project and still did not have an experience that was unanimously getting good feedbacks. At the time, we, were, we thought that we had, to, we had to make it work with cards. Other object, objects would be a, technically a huge undertaking, and cards are as enough to offer. But a friend of ours just mentioned how some it would be to play Tangram with our system. And what is special with Tangram is that it has an existing play patterns, validated by thousands of years of kids actually intuitively assembling those colored shape or non-color into more complex contours. A lot of thinking and coding later, we were ready to put a prototype of Tangram in front of kids. They knew exactly what to do, and the screen would give meaningful feedback. That was the early days of the Tangram map, which we shipped. Back to the cards now. The simplest play pattern, as I was saying, was to put a card. We had demos about with that play pattern, but we felt it was very simple until we actually put a Hangman uh, play uh, on the digital side, Hangman uh, again. The game mechanic on the digital side was intuitive. It's a wall to guess. And the mechanics on the physical side, as easy as it can get, you can just toss the card in front of the iPad. Then it was kind of simple, so we added Hangman with images. And then we say, hey, why not introducing a second player? So we did a two player Hangman with images. And that's how our world game was born. About a year into the project, we had 10 grand worlds for a while. We thought that 
we were not fully using the potential of the physical world, especially the fact that's open-ended and the fact that a lot of existing tools, that there are a lot of existing tools that the kids already master. This is when we looked very deeply at drawing, we looked at the simplest expression of drawing, a line. It took us a lot of work and to get right, to get the lines right to the screen from virtually anything. From there, it was just a matter of time before we tried to bounce balls on the lines, and the blueprint, the blueprint of Newton was, was there. So with Tangram, Words, and Newton, we focus mainly on puzzle game, and we have many other, many other areas to explore. Think about creativity, imagination, and much more. So we went from a proof of concept to a 3D printed prototypes to actually a pol polished product available in Apple Store in less than two years. We have gone from two employees to 14 full-time now. And we are very thankful for all the supports we got from our backers during the crowdfunding campaign. Introducing a new interaction model medium is challenging. And I feel that we were able to make it this far because we uniquely combined hardware design, computer vision, and game development into one room under one roof. If I were to give you one advice, I would say, just look at what kids do, how they interact with various subjects, and develop around these patterns. Thank you.